Hello, my name is David Cox, and I'm the IBM director of the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab, which is a unique uh, industry academic collaboration between MIT and IBM. It was founded in uh, 2017 uh, when IBM announced they were going to invest close to a quarter billion dollars over 10 years to found a collaborative lab. And I'm pleased to be here today to tell you about some of the work we're doing uh, together, and particularly in the space of neurosymbolic AI. Now, uh, I just said AI, and I just wanted to stop for a moment and just comment on this term artificial intelligence, because while I work at IBM Research now, you know, I, before that I worked uh, as a professor at, at Harvard for a number of years. And I will say 2018 and before, I think we've all had this experience that um, we were quite uncomfortable with this term artificial intelligence. You know, we would try and say machine learning or computer vision or be more specific and say things like deep learning. Um, but for whatever reason, 2018 and beyond, uh, I feel like we've all given up and we're all calling it AI. You know, we, you know, IBM calls it AI, Google calls it AI, academics call it AI. Um, but when I came to IBM Research uh, two years ago, I, I discovered this framework, which I, I really like. And I just want to share it with you for a brief moment, because I think it frames the discussion uh, that we're about to have in a good way. And that's simply to qualify what kind of type of AI we're talking about when we say the word AI or the, the term AI. And that's to distinguish what we have today as narrow AI. And that's not to say it's not powerful. It's not to say it's not disruptive, uh, but limited in important ways. And then also to distinguish from general AI, you know, the, the sort of strong AI, you know, the systems that can think for themselves. And then really identify in between uh, what I think the real opportunity is, which is what we're calling broad AI. Uh, and just to drill down, why is narrow AI narrow? Well, it's typically single task, single domain, one thing well. Uh, you can achieve some pretty amazing things with it, uh, superhuman accuracy and superhuman speed in certain cases, uh, but it does basically that one thing and that one thing well. You know, meanwhile, general AI, you know, that's cross-domain learning and reasoning, systems that are broadly autonomous that decide what they want to do for themselves. This is the kind of thing that Elon Musk calls summoning the demon or Stephen Hawking warns that, you know, could end mankind. You know, interesting philosophical debates, but I think everyone in this audience here at iClear, I think we'd all agree that we're we're not close to this. But in between, I think that's where there's real stakes. And that's really what uh, the lab that I run is, is uh, about. And that's really what we're targeting. So broad AI, you know, multitask, multi-domain, be able to take knowledge from one place and apply it in another place. Multimodal, be able to take data from lots of different sources, images, video, audio, structured data, unstructured data, text, you, know, you name it, bring it together. Uh, systems need to be distributed, uh, you know, be able to run in the cloud, but also increasingly at the edge. And we need systems increasingly for enterprise, which is what uh, IBM serves, where you know the systems are explainable because people aren't going to incorporate AI into their workflows unless they can understand what those systems are doing. So you know this is basically then a roadmap for uh, what we uh, at the MIT IBM lab think uh, we need to do we, the the kinds of AI that we need to push in advance to make AI broadly applicable to all of the hard problems that we'd like to solve with AI. Uh, and that includes a number of different facets, including explainability. You know, we can't have systems that are strictly black boxes. Really, people have to understand why they make the decisions that the systems make. They have to understand how to fix those systems if they make mistakes. Systems have to be secure. Uh, there's a whole new world of AI security that's emerging uh, that's, that's both concerning and also revealing interesting things about the underlying science uh, of deep learning that we didn't understand before. Um, it needs to be ethical, fair, you know, that's uh, both uh, a pro-social good, but also something that in many industries, uh, you know, is a regulatory, uh, you know, consideration, you know, banks can be, be fined, you know, huge sums of money if they fail to, uh, you know, demonstrably show fairness. And then the, the next piece is really about learning from small data. So uh, as much as people talk about big data, most of the problems that we see uh, from across all of our customers at IBM that they're trying to solve with AI are, are in many cases, small data problems. And even when enterprises have huge amounts of data, uh, if you don't have huge amounts of labels, obviously, then you're, you're back into this, uh, this problematic small data regime. So we think transfer learning is obviously very important there, uh, but increasingly uh, reasoning, being able to more flexibly extract structure from images and then be able to logically and flexibly reason over it uh, is going to be very important. And this is really the, the thing I'm going to talk about today and focus on today. So narrow, broad, general. But, you know, so what's narrow about today's AI toolbox? Okay, so uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I think we all saw this coming. You know, you know, by by the year 2015, Forbes published an article that said deep learning and machine intelligence will eat the world. Uh, and you know, I, I think it's fair to say that 
it, it really has in, in many ways. So, you know, this is an example of a piece of work from uh, Andre Carpathy and Fei Fei Li that really, for me, sort of uh, made me stop and say, okay, this is really incredible what neural networks are able to achieve. So this is a, you know, classic image captioning system where you take an image uh, and the system is able to produce a beautiful natural language caption, like a man in a black shirt is playing a guitar, or on the right, a construction worker in an orange safety vest is working on a road. Um, you know, meanwhile, there aren't many games left that, that humans are better at than machines. Everything from you know, Jeopardy, which IBM uh, did almost a decade ago, to uh, really amazing feats like uh, AlphaGo from DeepMind beating the, the World Go champion, uh, a group from Carnegie Mellon beat the world champion uh, in poker, uh, and, and IBM even built a system called Project Debater that'll carry on a debate. So uh, we'll even have systems that can argue with us if, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and even domains like art, uh, as we all know, are increasingly uh, you know, being uh, you know, invaded uh, in, in some ways by, by AI. So everything from early demonstrations of style transfer, uh, like this paper from uh, Matthias Betka's lab on, on the left, where you could take a photograph and re-render it in the style of any artist you like, all the way up to more recently, BigGAN, which can produce these you know, beautiful photorealistic uh, images, basically out of thin air. Uh, you know, it, it, it's hard not to have a feeling that, that deep learning is sort of taking over everything. Um, but there are some concerns. So, uh, so what is this image? Uh, now, if you ask a state-of-the-art ImageNet trained uh, convolutional neural network, you'll get an answer like this, teddy bear. And I would submit this is pretty much the least teddy bear image uh, that's possible. This is, this is very much not a teddy bear. Uh, in fact, it's a piece of uh, sort of subversive modern art called A Luncheon in Fur. It's in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And uh, we can, if, we, if we look at it and think for a moment, we can see where, where things are going wrong. And, and practitioners of computer vision already know this. This isn't uh, perhaps a surprise, but often the public has this idea that computer vision is a completely solved problem, when in reality, uh, when you have these sort of corner case images that go outside of the distribution of support you have for your, for your classifier, uh, you very frequently get these answers like teddy bear because things that were furry and roughly round in the training set tended more likely to be teddy bears. And it was very unlikely that you'd have a fur covered saucer cup and spoon uh, in your training set. Uh, and it's actually worse than that. You know, if you take state of the art object detection systems, uh, and again, this is, this is no secret. People who work in, in computer vision know this. Uh, this is a paper from Alan Ewell's lab in 2018. It showed that even just putting a few objects out of context uh, can cause state-of-the-art systems to, to fail badly. So if we put this guitar in front of a monkey, uh, even though we have no trouble as humans telling that's a guitar and a monkey, uh, the neural network now will decide that, that that guitar is a bird. You know, Perhaps not surprising because the kinds of things that you would see that are colorful and in jungles tend to be tropical birds. Interestingly, it also takes the monkey and thinks it's now a person because, you know, there probably weren't very many guitar playing monkeys in the training set. So, so some pretty serious weaknesses. Uh, and even this captioning system that we saw a minute ago, which was the thing that kind of blew my mind uh, and made me really think, okay, deep learning is, is, is really an incredible force to be reckoned with. You know, when we show it slightly corner case images, and this is, uh, you know, some work from Brendan Lake uh, and, and colleagues, um, you know, this one's a man riding a motorcycle on a beach. This one's an airplane is parked at the tarmac at an airport, and this one's a group of people standing on top of a beach. So uh, there's, a, which is true. Uh, so score one uh, for the for the deep learning system, but it gives you a sense that even though these systems are often producing you know beautiful captions that are in many cases correct, they're maybe not truly understanding the structure of what they're looking at. Um, and it, you know it gets even deeper than that. So if we look at uh, why is deep learning? What was really the inflection point for deep learning? Um, you know. ImageNet, arguably, a data set that was created by Fei-Fei Li, is really, you know, the, the spark that lit the, uh, the revolution for deep learning. You know, millions of carefully curated images. This was made possible by the digitalization of the world and the creation of the internet and, you know, the fact that we all now have digital cameras on our person at all time. Um, but we know that we as humans don't need this kind of data. You know, so if I show you this image, and even if you've never seen an example of this image before, uh, from one example, we can all be experts now. So if I ask you, is that, is that object present in this image? I think we'd all agree that it is. I can ask you questions like how many of that object are present in this image? And I think we can all agree that the answer is two. And I can show you images like this and say, is that object present in this image? And I think we'd all agree, mm, yeah, but it's, it's weird, right? So we can extrapolate beyond 
the setting we've seen an object in, and we only need one example, so you know, single shot, zero, one shot learning uh, to be able to do that. And that's in contrast to our current supervised uh, systems, which require you know thousands to millions of, of examples with, with carefully curated labels to be able to perform the amazing feats that can perform. Uh, so in contrast, my daughter, when she learned what a cat and a dog were, I didn't need to show her flashcards, cat, 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 dog, dog, dog. I could show her one and then boom, she'd get it. So, so this is really uh, something that we need if we're gonna apply AI much more broadly. And, and the problem is actually even a little bit more severe and subtle. Uh, the other problem with ImageNet is if you look at the category, of, for instance, a category like chairs, uh, we have all of these sort of canonically you know, positioned framed images of chairs that make up the chair category of ImageNet. Um, but uh, there's an interesting project that, uh, that we did in the lab, which was led primarily by Boris Katz and Andre Barbu, together with Dan Gutfreund from IBM. Uh, they created a data set called ObjectNet, where basically they asked, what would happen if we broke those correlations of you know, sort of the canonical views that you find in a, in a data set like ImageNet, which was sort of scraped from the internet? What if we took objects like a chair and we tipped it over, or we took a hammer uh, and we put it on the bed? Uh, how would these models perform? Uh, so what this team did was they created uh, an app uh, for phones and they had, uh, you know, crowdsourcing workers go and get assignments like take a hammer, bring it into your bedroom and fit it inside a mounting box on the phone, snap a picture or, you know, take, uh, you know, take a, a knife and put it in the kitchen on the sink, uh, sorry, in the bathroom on the sink and put it in this mounting box and snap. And they did this for 50,000 images across 300 object classes that overlap with the ImageNet object categories in four different kinds of rooms. Uh, and what they found was really striking. Uh, you know, uh, models that were performing, you know, the top ImageNet trained models, which were performing in the 90% range, which is in many cases even better than humans can do, just uh, simply because there's so many dog categories, different dog breed categories in ImageNet. It's hard for humans to actually do as well in some cases as ImageNet trained models, but you see these 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 models, which are you know this is arguably the success story of deep learning. These models take an enormous hit. You know they're they're down to 40, 45 percent performance when you put the objects just a little bit out of context. And just to be clear, you know humans retain 95 percent performance despite these these differences. So there's a sense in which you know something is missing. You know deep learning is clearly very powerful. Uh, but but we need something more, and and we need to keep pushing towards this goal of having systems that are that are sort of genuinely broadly applicable in any kind of setting that we want to put them in. Uh, and of course, you know, there's also this issue of hacking. So uh, adversarial examples. This is an example I like from Pin Yu Chen, who's at IBM Research, where uh, he took a captioning system more or less like the one uh, that I showed in the beginning of the talk, uh, and you know, a captioning system will produce a beautiful caption for that stop sign, like a red stop sign is sitting on the side of the road. Uh, with just a little bit of perturbation, which is below the perceptual threshold that we can see as humans, he, he can get it to, to be whatever caption he likes, including you know a brown teddy bear laying on top of the bed. So these are vulnerabilities that these systems have, and you know it's it's really fascinating to see just how severe these these gaps are. This is another thing that came out of uh, the lab I run. These are uh, this is uh, CJ Liu on the right and and Chuan Fu Chen, Chuan Fu Fan on the on the left, um, and uh, Chuan Fu you can see is wearing this very very ugly shirt. Uh, and uh, and then Sija's got a, a detection box around him. So there's a, a detector, a person detector that's detecting him. You could imagine this sort of being like a surveillance, uh, you know, like a AI surveillance setting. Uh, but because uh, that shirt is very carefully constructed so that it's an adversarial example, even under different lighting conditions, even if the cloth is folded or bent, uh, you can see the situation where uh, it basically makes him invisible uh, to to the the AI detection. So sort of like AI camouflage. So uh, there are really you know serious vulnerabilities, and we need to figure out how what, what, how those are how those work. Um, but you know even cases where we can give the system as much data as we like, uh, we're still in a regime where we we struggle to get neural networks, deep learning, to solve certain kinds of problems. Uh, and there's lots of these sort of intuitive, common sense, intuitive physics kinds of problems like these. These are examples from our collaborator, Josh Tenenbaum at MIT. Um, like, you know, if you have to ask, answer, how many blocks are on the right of the three-level tower? That's the kind of thing that, that even a child can, can reason about and answer. But it turns out these are things that are quite challenging still for, for deep learning systems. Or, uh, you know, sort of intuitive physics questions like, will the block tower fall if the top block is removed? Or are there more trees than animals? Again, this is uh, from, from Josh, uh, Josh Tenenbaum's lab. 
Uh, or in this case, you know, what is the shape of the object closest to the large cylinder? Uh, and this one, uh, this is a data set that was created uh, by a group uh, across Stanford and, and FAIR, uh, including Fei Fei Li, called Clever. And this data set was really created, uh, you know, sort of to illustrate this problem, which is when you have these sort of combinatorially complex arrangements of objects, these are just rendered objects. So it's very easy to create question answer pairs where the answer is known because the objects are rendered. Uh, but even these simple sort of questions that require us to, to reason about the relationships between objects, it seems like deep learning systems, to the extent that they're able to solve them, require almost unreasonable amounts of data to make that work. Uh, so this is really then, um, you know, what we want to get at and ask, you know, okay, if we want AI to be, again, broadly applicable, how do we solve this problem? And, you know, one of the approaches that we're taking, you know, kind of one of the big bets we're making uh, is actually going all the way back to the beginning of AI. You know, so I mentioned this term AI, um, you know, at the beginning of the talk. And it turns out, if, if you don't know, the history is that the term artificial intelligence was coined way back in 1956 uh, at a Dartmouth workshop that was co-proposed by people like, uh, like uh, you know, John McCarthy, who's a future MIT professor. And actually, also, it turns out, uh, Nathaniel Rochester, uh, you can tell, uh, who is an IBMer. So he developed the IBM 701, which was one of the first mass-produced computers. Uh, you can tell who the IBMers are in this picture because basically they're the ones wearing ties. Um, but... Uh, together with people like Marvin Minsky, Claude Shannon, uh, got together back in 1956, coined this term artificial intelligence, and sort of imagined this, this future we'd all be in together. Um, but the interesting thing is, uh, of course, neural networks were around back then. Uh, they weren't called deep learning yet. Deep learning was sort of a rebrand that was attached in the 21st century. Uh, but neural networks were around back at that time. And as we all know, uh, you know, everyone in the audience is, is you know, perfectly well aware, uh, you know, a neural network is basically a kind of nonlinear function approximator in this setting. So we can take in an input, like a complex input, like, a, like an image of an apple, uh, and then we can map it from what we have, which are images, to what we want, which is some kind of class label. Uh, and, you know, if that's the, the, the neuron that corresponds to apple, uh, then we can get a, some sort of readout of the probability we think an apple is present. Now, that's the neural network approach and you know everything in between you know it's obviously learnable weights and that's how the magic happens um, but there was another kind of AI that's been around since the beginning and of course many in the audience will be you know very familiar with this uh, this notion of symbolic AI and in the world of symbolic AI uh, we have a slightly different representation of an apple so an, an, you know an apple is not just going from an image a machine that turns an image into you know one hot coded uh, vector but there's stuff we know about the apple. We know that an apple has an origin, comes from an apple tree. We know that an apple has structure. It's got a body, it's got a stem, different parts. The body can have a shape, it's round, it can have size, it fits in your hand, it's got color, it can be red or green. Uh, we know that an apple is a kind of fruit. We know all kinds of things about the taxonomy of you know, apples and the evolution of, of different kinds of plants. So there's all this knowledge that we have. Uh, and the conceit, the central you know, premise of symbolic AI is, um, we can use that knowledge uh, and different kinds of knowledge to be able to symbolically, you know, manipulate the symbols that are represented in a structure like this to bring them to bear on solving problems. So, uh, you know, and I would argue that when we when we make a decision about whether something is an apple or not, or we make a decision about whether something is a fur covered saucer, cup and spoon, or it's a teddy bear, we bring all of that knowledge to bear. And I think that's one of the things that may be missing uh, from today's AI. And you know. In particular, uh, we, you know, we've been working on this, this theme within the MIT IBM lab. And you know, this has been a collaboration uh, between Chuang Gan, who's at our own, uh, you know, at IBM Research uh, with us in Cambridge, together with Josh Tenenbaum at MIT, uh, as well as uh, his, his former student, Jia Jun Wu, who's now a professor at Stanford, on this notion of neural symbolic AI. So if we have um, neural networks, we have symbolic AI. Um, the idea is that in many ways, we feel that AI, that sort of deep learning and symbolic AI in many ways complement each other's strengths and weaknesses. And as, as you all know, you know, artificial neural networks have been around for a long time and in many ways they were waiting. So, you know, there've been AI springs and winters um, and, you know, there were various times when, you know, neural networks, everyone knew they didn't work. Uh, but what really made them advance wasn't necessarily primarily, at least initially, a conceptual advance. It was the availability of compute, you know, in the form particularly of GPUs, as well as the availability of data. You know, the world became digital. We had digital images all over the place. 
that together with this explosion of Moore's law, in particular, this uh, you know, emergence of GPUs, which turned out to be great for doing this, that was the thing that ignited you know, deep learning and, and neural networks. Symbolic AI, you know, it's been around the entire time. It's, it's still around, um, but it hasn't enjoyed a resurgence yet. And one of the you know, central theses of the work that we're doing is that uh, in many ways, symbolic AI has also been waiting just the same way that deep learning was waiting, but what it's been waiting for is neural networks. And the idea being that neural networks solve many of the problems of symbolic AI. Uh, and then in many ways, symbolic AI uh, either solves or provides a roadmap for how you might solve the problems that, that I just illustrated about, about deep learning that it has today. So, um, you know, let's look at this, this data set Clever uh, for a moment. Again, Clever was created to illustrate a problem, you know, to a first approximation, to illustrate a problem with current neural networks, which is it, these simple sort of uh, visual question answering problems where you have, uh, you know, an image and you have to answer a question like, what's the shape of the red object? These problems require huge amounts of supervision to train in the traditional end-to-end -end way, you know, and of course in neural networks, end-to-end -end is sort of the mantra. Uh, and even when you do it end-to-end, -end, you know, and you train with huge amounts of data, in many cases, they don't perform, you know, completely, you know, completely solve the task. So, you know, this is what you're supposed to do, you know, in some sense with the neural network, you, you take what you have, uh, you want to, uh, and then you want to map it to what you want, which is an answer. Uh, and then you try not to get in the way. You know, there's a lot of decisions about, how we want to construct the architecture in between. But uh, the idea basically is don't do anything that gets in the way because you're just sort of getting farther away from optimizing anything you're trying to optimize. Uh, and this is kind of the, you know, one of the, you know, the lessons of, of the last few years or last number of years in, in deep learning. Now, the problem with this is that the concepts, things like colors and shapes and the reasoning, you know, you know processes like counting or, or, or doing a, an identity operation, um, they're entangled, you know, so the neural network, because you're just doing this end to end, there's, there's not a lot of incentive not to mix these things together in the network. And what that does is that makes it hard, you know, a couple things. One is it makes it hard to, to really completely solve the task, but then it also really makes it very difficult to transfer to other kinds of tasks like image captioning or in instance retrieval. Uh, and, and this is the kind of thing where, you know, humans, again, we don't need to train in multiple different tasks to be able to, 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 to solve a problem. But once we know something about the world, we can very flexibly apply that to different, uh, different problem settings. Uh, so let's unpack the task of, of this question answering. So if we have an image like the one on the left and we have a question, are there an equal number of large things in metal spheres? How, how would we solve this problem? Well, first of all, you know, the question asks something about large things. So we, you know, sort of, interrogate the image. We use our visual system to ask, okay, how many large things are there? There's three large things. Good. Uh, we look at another part of the question. We see there's something about metal spheres. Okay. Um, we use our visual system and we identify all the things that are metal and spheres. Okay. Good. Um, but then critically, you know, we, we have to do an equality operation, which is fundamentally a, you know, it's more like a logical symbolic operation. Are we, we're going to compare two quantities and then we decide, yes, the, the answer to this question is yes. And if we unpack that, what we see is that, you know, part of the problem is visual perception. And that's something that, you know, CNN's convolutional neural networks are, is, are good at. Um, part of it's question understanding. And, and we know, um, you know from the amazing successes of deep learning in natural language processing that, that recurrent neural networks and other kinds of uh, deep learning methods are, are very strong uh, at understanding questions. But then there's a piece which is uh, much more like logical reasoning. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to filter, we're going to do a series of operations in a particular order, and then we're going to do an equality operation. Um, so what the team did, uh, this, again, this collaboration uh, between uh, some folks uh, at IBM together with MIT and a few other people at other institutions, uh, was to build you know, a hybrid system, which took a convolutional neural network to, for the vision component. Uh, you know, this is sort of the standard thing you would, you would expect to do. But rather than just trying to go straight to the answer, um, what, what it's going to do is it's going to de-render the scene into a structured scene representation. So de-rendering in the sense that, you know, you know, renderers like, uh, like for 3D movies or whatever, you know, they go from a structured representation of what are the objects and where are they to an image. And de-rendering is just going the other direction, taking the image and going back to a structured representation, identifying all the objects and their properties and everything we know about them. And then we're going to go with the question, and in this case, using a recurrent neural network, because we know that those are good for doing uh, language, natural language processing. But instead of a traditional language, you know, either a traditional end-to-end -end system where we just put that all together and try and get the answer, 
or traditional language applications where you might translate into another sequence or where you might translate into, uh, you know, or, or classify, you know, the sentiment or the, the quality of the answer directly. Um, here, the neural network is translating from the question, the natural language, to a symbolic program, a series of operations, symbolic operations that we can run to get the answer. Uh, so you take that symbolic program, then you run it on the structured representation, and you can get the answer. Now, a critical piece here is that we're not just taking, uh, you know, the pencil and the eraser and putting them together and calling it a day. We're not just taking neural networks and symbolic processing and jamming them together and saying we're done, bolting them together. Instead, the system is trained jointly with reinforcement learning. That allows the neural networks to learn something different than they would have learned on their own by virtue of being part of the symbolic system. So you can exercise the whole system after some pre-training, um, get this, the symbolic program to run, get the answer, the answer is right or wrong, and just with a standard reinforce algorithm, uh, you can then uh, train, train both uh, the, the RNN and the CNN to, to, to find, you know, do better at extracting the symbols, better at de-rendering the symbolic representation of the scene, uh, but also be better at translating from natural language to a symbolic program. And just to, to walk that through how that works, so you take an image like that, language is what's the shape of the red object, uh, the scene is parsed into uh, you know, a series of IDs, and there's an object, it's green, it's a cube, and it's, it's at a particular location, there's another object, it's red, it's a sphere, it's made of rubber, uh, semantic parsing, we're going to take that question and we're going to turn it into a program, uh, so in this case there's a filter operation and then a very simple query operation, this is just a sort of purpose-built, uh, you know, domain-specific language for the purpose of this uh, demonstration. And then you do some symbolic reasoning. Um, and, you know, you walk through, you, you filter, you find the one that's red, you query what's the shape of it, and you get the answer. So, uh, you know, in some ways, very simple, uh, but I think there's a powerful idea here about mixing these two things together. Now, there's three advantages that come with this. So just adding in a very simple dash of symbolic operation, a symbolic processing to the, to the mix, one thing you get right out of the box is incredibly high accuracy. So uh, when this paper was published in, in NeurIPS back in 2018, uh, the performance was 99.8% performance. So this is effectively perfect performance. So while previous methods had gotten close to, to you know, getting perfect performance on this task, um, requiring huge amounts of data, uh, none of them had really quite completely cracked the nut. So uh, you know, as of this time, you know, this clever data set is basically a solved data set. Uh, and, you know, it just took a little dash of symbolic processing to get it done. Uh, even more importantly, though, is this notion of data efficiency. So again, remember, you know, we're able to work in most cases, uh, many cases with single examples, whereas, you know, supervised learning with deep learning requires, you know, the more data, the better, but huge amounts of data is required. The interesting thing about this, this algorithm is, again, just adding in a dash of symbolic processing, you can get high accuracy, better accuracy than, than other methods, but just 1%, you, know, you can get acceptable performance with just 1% of the amount of data that the other methods require. And if you allow yourself 10% of the amount of data, you can basically completely solve the task. So where other methods that are purely deep learning based require you know, hundreds, many hundreds of thousands, almost a million examples to be able to perform well, uh, this method is able to train with, with an order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude smaller amounts of data. So this is a huge advantage. This is, again, one of the things that was preventing us from getting into this sort of world of um, broad AI that, that we we're trying to get to. And then the other, the third thing uh, is transparency and interpretability. So uh, if you have an end-to-end -end neural network, there, there's a lot of work about how do you back out what that neural network knows and what it's doing and how it works and how to think about the answers it's giving. But this method in to, you know, intrinsically, because it has this symbolic choke point in the middle where it produces a symbolic program and it, it sort of has a symbolic representation of the scene, you can step through in a very understandable way to understand not only how did it arrive at the answer, but you know, if it got the right answer, did it get to the right answer by the right, the right path? Was it looking at the right objects? Was it following the right series of steps? Uh, and this is, uh, again, I can't estimate, I can't overestimate, I cannot overstate in the real world how important this is that people who are going to be using AI be able to understand, you know, imagine, you know, mission critical settings where people's lives might be on the line. You really want a system where you're sure it's it's giving you the answer that makes sense. It kind of needs to show you its work. Uh, so this is something that just intrinsically falls out of these kinds of hybrid approaches. Now, uh, the, the work I showed you is, that, you know, is actually, uh, you, know, uh, you know, over a year and a half old. This was the, you know, the, the first work that this team did uh, in NeurIPS in 2018. Uh, the team followed up last year at iClear with something called the Neurosymbolic Concept Learner. And, you know, the way to think about this, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it in a moment, 
uh, where previously the properties and the, the like color and the values like red were predefined in that original paper uh, with the neurosymbolic concept learner, uh, you could autonomously learn new value, you know, new values like red. You know, you could introduce a new color and the system would be able to under, like, uh, adopt a new concept to go with that new color. Um, you know, last year at NeurIPS, uh, the team uh, extended further something called the neurosymbolic concept metaconcept learner. Uh, that can learn relationships between concepts and start to get to the notion of what would it take to learn a new concept. Uh, and then even, uh, and then I clear this year, you know, in the main conference, uh, you'll, you'll see there's um, extending this work to, uh, you know, dynamic scenes, looking at counterfactual scenarios. I'll tell you about that in a moment as well. Uh, and this is sort of a, a pro, you know, a program of work, uh, you know, and this is a little bit of a roadmap. And really what we're driving towards is having systems that are less and less predefined that can learn autonomously, but still retain this, this sort of symbolic understanding of the world and that are increasingly more autonomous. And I think this is really then for us at least, um, you know, I think others in the field as well, this is what we're driving towards. How can we make systems that are more genuinely autonomous that can acquire knowledge that's flexible and can be used across multiple different tasks, but it can do it in a way that doesn't require this, these huge amounts of supervision uh, that the current methods seem to require. So the neurosymbolic concept learner, I'm just gonna uh, run through a few of these. Uh, pretty quickly, but you know this this was an attempt to uh, have a more flexible notion of of concepts like colors like red. They don't have to be predefined, but instead uh, we have uh, you know we again we go from the question to a symbolic program. So we have a series of operations like we have to filter for red and then query the shape of the object. Um, we're still using as you know the team here is still using a CNN to represent the visual uh, content of the image, and there's a you know sort of a that gets mapped into a general representation space. But critically then, we also map uh, down into sort of conceptual spaces, uh, like color space, uh, and then concepts like, like red can live in this color space, you know, in, in, in a, a, a you know, vector embedding, where you can now reason about uh, whether you know, an object is likely to belong to, have a particular property. And importantly, because it's now a learned concept space, you can you can acquire new concepts uh, and, and you can start to be much more flexible. Of course, you know, I, I laid out this vision that, hey, you know, one of the advantages of symbolic AI is we also have all these relationships and we can sort of make uh, leaps, uh, sort of logical leaps where we can understand that the two things are related or similar or they have particular relationships. Um, the, the team, you know, on the very next uh, NERPS, on the next sort of, uh, you know, click of, uh, of the conference clock, um, introduce this meta concept learning notion. So there's still visual reasoning questions like, you know, is there a red cube? And you know, the answer would be yes. And is there a green block? And the answer is yes. Um, interestingly, um, you know, tied up in that in those two very simple questions, are, there's a lot of uh, subtlety and structure there. Um, like, you know, we can ask meta conceptual questions like. Is red the same kind of concept as green? Are, are they both, you know, examples of colors? You know, are they the same kind of concept? Uh, and we can also ask questions about, you know, synonyms, right? I, the first question said cube. The second section question said block. You know, that's not something that we we, we that we typically struggle with, uh, because we know that cube and block are synonyms of each other. Uh, so there's this conceptual learning, um, you know, sort of set of uh, of questions, and there's also uh, sort of a meta conceptual level of understanding the relationships between those concepts and how they how they are, how they interlock and are related to each other. Uh, and uh, you know, in this case, uh, the, the the team also worked on on the, not just synonyms, also things like hypernyms. Right? So, is, is is an ivory gull an example of uh, you know a species in the in the in the group of Laridae? Uh, and and again, this is uh, this is from the the Caltech USD birds data set. Uh, and then we can ask, you know, meta-conceptual questions. And the critical thing here is the idea is that uh, these meta-conceptual uh, questions can operate on the same conceptual space and help us, uh, you know, bring more structure to that space through learning, uh, but also be able to make some of these sort of conceptual leaps, uh, you know, sort of logical leaps that we're able to make uh, fluidly as humans, but uh, that our, our systems really struggle with today. Um, so, sorry, this is just a repeat. Um, so, so when you have a you know a question again, we detect the objects, we we extract features, we have you know the, these these features which can then be embedded in a conceptual space. We parse the question into a symbolic program, uh, and then you can you know basically step by step execute this program, and then be able to make a decision about what the answer is. Uh, with these meta conceptual questions, there's you know, then a separate system that is just trained on 
on uh, the, the, the natural language questions by themselves, but operating on the same conceptual space. So you can parse that into a, a meta program. We're going to metify, meta verify whether red and yellow are the same kind of concept. Uh, and then we go in and we can produce an answer. And, and what that lets us do then is uh, during training, you can see examples like question, is there an airplane? The answer is yes. Um, is there a plane? That's a slightly different way of saying airplane. The answer is yes. Uh, and you know, other uh, questions like, is there a kid? The answer is yes. Is there a child? Yes, we know that kid and child are the same, but the system hasn't been explicitly told that. And if we've seen questions before, we understand the concept of a synonym. So we can know that is an airplane a synonym of plane? And we know that the answer is yes. We have a, a notion we've trained of what a synonym is. Then we can make these sort of generalization leaps and say a kid and child also synonyms. And then we can be able to, to do that because we have these operators on the same conceptual space. Uh, and you can show, you know, obviously, um, you know, compared to straight neural network methods that some of these inductive leaps are, 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 are much easier when you add in a little bit of this, this sort of symbolic processing. Uh, and then uh, this year at the, at the conference, you know, the team is, is still, you know, active, uh, publishing in every conference, kind of on this, this roadmap. Uh, there's a new data set called Clever that, uh, that, that's being introduced which is taking uh, Clever, but taking it from static scenes to, uh, to video, to dynamic scenes, and includes uh, descriptive questions like, what is the material of the last object collide with the, the cyan cylinder? These are still hard <laughs> questions to, 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 to answer with just a, a pure end-to-end -end approach. Um, but you know, it's, it's fundamentally descriptive. You know, we can watch the scene unfold and then answer the question. Uh, there's explanatory questions we can ask, like, what is responsible for the collision between the rubber and metal cylinders? Now we're, we're starting to get to another level of, of reasoning where we not only can say what happened, but what were the causes? You know, what, what was the, you know, what explains the results that we saw? And then really interestingly, we can also do counterfactuals. And this is also included in the Clever data set. So what would happen if the cyan cylinder weren't there? So we can now ask the system to reason. You know, again, this is something that humans uh, we're perfectly adept at this. We can uh, not only say what happened, but we can also imagine alternate scenarios. And this is a big part of how we plan our lives and, and achieve complex goals is we ask ourselves, what would happen if I did this? What, would, what could I have done differently that would have led to a different result? And we think that this is really um, you know, the core of an awful lot of intelligence. Now, uh, you might ask, why does IBM uh, care about this? Uh, aside from this being... You know, I think an interesting scientific direction. When you look again at, at the kinds of problems that we face in the real world, I would actually argue that the vast majority of them, the, you know, the problems that businesses face, the problems that we face in our daily lives, aren't the you know, we're going to have a river of data and we're going to train a classifier and, and get results out. Uh, they're much more like one-off puzzles. Like you know, I might want to know how many employees are, have over ten years of experience with a new location in the last year, or what factors might contribute to better output from factory A versus factory factory B. Or why is our database down? You know, are we being hacked uh, by, by hackers or you know, did somebody push bad code into production and that's why our database is you know, DDoS, you know, our system's DDoSing our own database. Um, these kinds of problems, you don't get lots and lots of training examples. Like hackers aren't gonna hack your system a million times before it matters. It actually matters the very first time it happens. And when you look at how we as humans solve these problems, it's much more like, you know, problem solving, you know, we, it's a puzzle. We, we go in, we extract the structure of the world, we build a mental model, we reason about it, and then we do more experiments to refine our mental model. And I think that really is the crux where we're heading towards. And we think that these ideas of, you know, fundamentally symbolic manipulation, whether they be done with traditionally symbolic systems or be done with neural networks that operate on symbols, that's really, we think, the, the magic. And we think that actually 99% of the problems that we face in the real world have much more of this flavor than, than this, the simple sort of, um, you know, huge amounts of data kind of, kind of approach. Uh, now, this is actually a, a research program across much of the lab. So the, I showed you one example of some work uh, that we're doing together with Josh Tenenbaum's lab in particular at MIT. Uh, this is something that we think is actually important across, you know, the entire spectrum of AI work that we do. So we have work in neurosymbolic generative models um, that, that's hopefully coming out soon. Um, we have work on uh, doing safe uh, machine learning, a safe RL, basically using symbolic methods to verify uh, the behavior of neural network and machine learning methods. We have work in neurosymbolic natural language understanding. 
We have examples of mixing neural networks together with planning, you know, another classical tradition uh, in, in symbolic AI. Uh, Neurosymbolic code optimization. We have a paper, um, uh, sorry, the year, that's wrong. That's at this year's iClear in 2020 um, on using neurosymbolic methods to look at code, to optimize the code. Uh, and then we also have a lot of work going on, uh, again, together with Josh's lab as part of the DARPA program on how do we in, you know, get machines to have what we would call common sense, sort of all the base level knowledge that's not written down anywhere about the affordances of how the world works. Um, I'll just give you just a few little uh, you know, teasers of some of that work. Uh, so this is some work mixing uh, traditional good old fashioned AI symbolic planning with neural networks. And this is some work from uh, Masataro Asai, who's with us in Cambridge at, at IBM Research, at the MIT IBM lab, um, looking at how you solve problems, very classical problems, like these little tile puzzles where you move the pieces around and you try and get them in a particular order or try and produce a picture, or problems like the Tower of Hanoi. Those are, are you know classically things that planning algorithms are very good at. And we have lots of heuristics for how do you search the space of potential actions to um, to get to an answer, uh, you know this is you know a, a, a very mature field. But uh, you know these methods assume that you start with the symbols. And the question is, can we much more flexibly go from a world that's messy, which is really the domain of what neural networks are good at, uh, and make make the world compatible through neural networks with algorithms like planning? Uh, and this this lat plan algorithm uh, does does just that, which is basically using um, autoencoders. Uh, and forcing them uh, with, you know, basically a soft uh, gumbo softmax to produce discrete representations, which are compatible with planning, and then being able to use the late, basically do planning in in a in a discrete latent space of the autoencoder, uh, and we can find that we can we can solve problems uh, that, that would be difficult to solve otherwise using this method. And th this is a line of research that that we're, we're continuing in many different directions. Uh, also, just to give another shout out, uh, work on verifiably safe reinforcement learning. So being able to uh, have scenarios where you want to have uh, a machine learning algorithm or deep learning algorithm or reinforcement learning algorithm uh, to, to, to take actions like driving, say, a, an autonomous vehicle. Um, but you really want to be able to have some kinds of guarantees on, on, on the, the, the safety and the, you know, the safety policy around those systems. Uh, so Nathan Fulton, uh, who, who's with us again at, at IBM Research in Cambridge in the MIT IBM lab, is working on building hybrids again of these systems where you can include some of the guarantees of, of verifiability with, with deep learning to get kind of a, a, a best of both worlds. So, uh, you know, that's just a few very, very brief glimpses of some of the stuff we're working on. We're very excited about this intersection. Um, and I, I think really the, the key of it boils down to um, being able to leverage the power of neural networks. We're not saying, you know, neural networks are wrong in any way, shape, or form. It's an incredibly powerful set of tools. But the goal uh, in many cases, if we want to be able to have the sample efficiency that we need to address real world problems, we want to have the richness and the flexibility we need. We think that something like symbols, uh, you know, and, and, and whether we manipulate the symbols with traditional uh, symbolic AI or we build neural networks that manipulate those symbols. The, the idea that we have rich representations, you know, structures that, that uh, like, like trees, uh, structures like graph structures, like programs, uh, that level of richness and all of the strength uh, that we've developed over the years with manipulating those kinds of structures married together with neural networks, we think that's a tremendously powerful combination. And we're making, uh, you know, kind of our big bet on, on that and putting a lot of resources behind it. Um, so we're very excited about it. We hope uh, you're excited about it too. Uh, and I'm very happy at this point to take any questions you might have uh, over, over the video conference. All right. Thank you.